All right, welcome to the Sales After Dark. Man, this is your host, Victor Antonio. Thank you for joining me. If it's your first time watching this or you're watching it on the replay, here's how it works. If you're watching it on the replay, fast forward another five minutes because I'm going to say hi to my Sales After Dark family. Uh, and if it's your first time, man, let me know it's your first time and where you're from, man. Let's let's bring some up here. Let's see who's here. Oh, Uncle John is in the house, man. The value merchant. Hey, Victor, are we in a conference or, <laughs> or are we in a celebration? I miss you saying that. That's one of those intros to my one of my speeches. I always ask people, are we in a conference or are we in a celebration? Clap if you think we're in a conference. A few people clap. I kick them out of the room. Uh, it's a joke I have. We have... Whew, it's a, Yash Vardan Patil, I think I got it right. Good morning. Let me know where you're from. And if this is your first time, my girl Mia Knox, West Coast. There you go, Mia Knox. Always great to have you. Shrutesh in the house. I love your last video. Your music taste is great. Man, I love I love music, man. Shrutesh. I was like raised on music. I, I was actually raised on. I love I loved a lot of R and B and funk. Uh, so my favorite funk band are the Bar K's. So if you know who the Bar K's are, let me know, man, because that means you know funk. Arvin from Mumbai. Arvin, man, thank you for joining us, man. It's got to be early over there. Sai Papu, did I get that right? Good morning. We got Dwight Beal, ready to learn and make a new difference in this new normal. Boom, Dwight, let's do that, man. Where you from, Dwight? Let me know. I think it's the first time, right, Dwight? Ahmed Noor, Victor from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Love it, man, love it. Herb Walsh is back. Respect for salespeople is on the rise. Hey, man, we're value merchants. Just ask Inkle, man. We're value merchants. Look, man, salespeople, I was having this discussion the other day with somebody about, you know, salespeople again, and I said, without us, nothing moves. I mean, if you really think about it, we're the only walking profit centers around. So, hey, you know how it is. All right, Nyla Monet, she's back. Thank you for coming back, Nyla. Appreciate you. We got you the man, 1K. You know I love that name, man. You know I love that name, man. Good morning from India. Tahir. Welcome, man. All right. Brian's in the house from Las Vegas. Man, I don't know. I think we got you beat on humidity this time, Brian. I think we got you beat on humidity. Uh, hi, Victor. Long time. Hope you're well. Where have you been, Bilal? Where have you been? Dwight Beal from Oklahoma City. Man, all right, man. I hear you, brother. Uh, Arvin Garcia, hello from the Philippines. Will you introduce your sponsor at CRM today? I trust your recommendations. I will be introducing my, well, I did mention it in the last one. Uh, so, uh, but the actual sponsor is going to be Pipe Drive. So I can say that now, but my first sponsor uh, will be on August 1st, which is uh, Sunday, man. So Sunday will be the, uh, the first time I'll really be talking about that. If I think it is Sunday or the second, one of those, the second. Sorry about that. So, yeah, man, uh, I like the company. I think it's a great company, super happy. Jared, my man, like I said, we couldn't connect this week. Sorry about that, but we're on for next week, man, for sure, man. Check Jared out, man, Mr. Trinidad Tobago, the salesman himself. Tarun, always from Delhi, India, man. One day, man, one day, me and Delhi, India tonight. I'm early tonight, Jared, but you made it, brother. You made it, man. Uh, there he is. My man, sales go out. Thank you, Dwight, man. I appreciate that, man. Uh, Barbara Tyree from Jacksonville. Love it, man. Gigi Sanchez, man. Salutations from Los Cabos, Mexico. Saludos, hermano. Bienvenido. Uh, who else is in the house? We got Brenda Bella. I'm going to just call you Bella because it's beautiful, man. By the way, if you're watching this and it's your first time, I'm going to go through a couple of these before we actually get into the content. And so I just got to say hi to my fam. All right, Camlesh, good morning, man. Gigi's back. Gigi, you're a first timer. Gigi, all right. Love it. And then there he is, Luigi Giovanetti. That guy, right? So, man, welcome, man. Todd Weinstein. Was King Vic, you're the man. No, Todd, you're the man, man. So, uh, we got Cheryl Cham in the house from the Philippines, man. It's so cool. Uh, got you on Oklahoma City. The guy with the same name twice. There he is again from Edmonton, man. Good to have you here. Henry, man, I think I've been missing for a while. You've been missing in action, Henry, man. I've missed you, man. So we got Elkin. Boom. We got Steve. I'm going to go through some of these. A lot of guys. There. Online, ready to learn, man. Thank you, man. Steve, Queens in the house. Love it, man. New York, New York, big city of dream. Love your seven points on Sunday show. Thank you, man. Did my best on that one. Mike K from Orlando. Man, Sarah Masters from Toronto. Man, following your book. Way to go, man. I'll be also, Sarah and others, 
Uh, so I'm finally going to release my new book. Um, I, fi I changed the title of the book because I felt like I needed to. It just wasn't resonating. So uh, after this time next week, I'll probably announce it. And then I'm going to give you guys, because you're my fam, I'll give you a special link where you can download it for free. How's that, man? I, you're going to love it. It's all about upselling, man. So it's going to be cool. Uh, and there it is, Jared. Nothing happens till the sale is made. Because of you, I am busy now to join your podcast. Oh, that's kind of a, it kind of backfired on me, right? But I hope you're making money, man, and doing good things for good people. Good evening from Arizona, Christopher Pacheco, man. Thank you. Monet, are you planning to come back to TV in the future? Coming back to TV in the future. By the way, have you guys seen my television show? If you saw my television show, Life or Debt, hit me with the number one. The show is called Life or Debt. Hit me with the number one. I'm gonna do a few of these, but man, we got a big, we got a, we got, we're crowded tonight. Sai, is this Sai or Sai? Papu, woohoo, Victor. Yes, you got my name right. I did get it right the first time. Okay, I shouldn't mess with it then. And then there's the source, Big Vic. What's happening? Looking dapper, gentle. I mean, I'm trying to do my best here, man. My wife dresses me well, so that's real cool. Gigi, I got you. Three percent humidity today. Yeah, man, we got a bat over here, man. Chad Schaefer, thank you for coming, man. Sunday, 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 man. All right, we got Henry Thomas. Hi, VA. A lot of appreciation. Thanks for the time you take to uh, to such an amazing information. Appreciate you, man. Kenry, where are you from, man? I don't think I've ever heard the word name Kenry. Henry, obviously, but Kenry, first time, man. Let me know where you're from. Kevin Durkin, what's going on, Vic? Not much. Hanging out with you, Kevin Durkin. That's what I'm doing. And then we got Kenry Thomas. Nicaragua, you got a Wednesday, all right, man. Uh, let me see who else is this. Uh, Gigi Sanchez, I'm a female and first time. You're still cool, Gigi, whether you're man or female, doesn't matter to me, you're still cool with that name. Uh, Jada, J Jada Beats, do you actually do beats, man? Hi from Australia, the land down under, mate. Uh, from Jacksonville, we got Kevin Durkin, that's cool, man. Uh, Carlos. Carlos Alfonso Gonzalez. I love the way you have to kind of just put all those names in there. Saludos, bienvenido al show. Gracias. Uh, let me see who else. We got Razas. I love some of these names. Razas Wolf from Singapore. Singapore is a fine city. Uh, you know the joke if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, O'Reilly from my hometown, Chicago, man. Where are you from, Jerry? I'm from the northwest side, man, like Chicago, uh, Milwaukee, Ashland, Division, that area, man. That's where I'm, I'm from, man. Henry says, couldn't tune in live, but got lessons on the replay. That's cool. I'll take that, man. And all right, we're just going to do it. By the way, thank you for answering my question, because because uh, email on my software platform for enterprise account planning. Thank you. You're very welcome. I hope it helped. Uh, I think I recommend it was Terminus, right? We talked about it. It's an interesting company, and I'll be talking about the book they wrote, Carlos, on Sunday, uh, which is about account-based marketing. You might want to tune into that. I think it's going to be cool. So Sunday is going to be a good day to tune in, man. Nearly finished the Sales Velocity Academy. It's amazing. The Sales Velocity Academy is my online academy. And if you haven't joined, why not? I'm just telling you, I think it's the best deal in town. I think it's probably one of the most comprehensive, um, you know, uh, libraries online when it comes to selling. Check it out. Arvin says, one, he's seen the show, man. That's really cool. All right. Roland Martinez. Que paso, hermano, from Houston. Nada pasa, hermano. And there he is, my mentor. This man is killing it, man. He's killing it. My man, Adriano Giovanni. Sales dude. Check him out, man. Awesome dude, man. Awesome guy. And let me see. We got Ontario Canada in the house. I'm going to do a couple more. Uh, yes, uh, Russ, I got it. I'm in a fine city. He knows what that means. Alfredo Maza. Como estas, Victor? Gracias por enseñar. enseñar. You're welcome, man. Then nada. So who else? All right, one more and that's it. We got Alan. You're the last one in from Melbourne, Australia, man. Alan, welcome for joining. Welcome aboard. All right. Now, again, uh, so what I typically do is about maybe 15, 20 minutes of content, and then I open it up for questions. And so, by the way, you know, I got this question that I, I never really talked about how the concept of sales after dark came about. And I wanted to do like an evening show, and I didn't have a name for it, right? And so I was going, yeah, I just want to do something after dark, right? And so I remembered years ago that Hugh Hefner had this show called Playboy After Dark. This is, this is an honest story. I'm being very honest and very serious here, not trying to make a joke out of this. And so I remember, yeah, Playboy After Dark. I said, I should do something called Sales After Dark. And the more I said Sales After Dark, I go, yeah, that's a great idea. So anyway, the whole purpose of the show is that obviously to give you a just a very like sniper-like piece of content that you can use 
but also, you know, it's it's after work, you can relax. So hopefully right now, you you know, I know some of you are in the morning if you're in India, uh, Singapore, I don't know what time it is over there, but most of us here in the U.S. obviously are just kind of chilling, ready to go, you know, not go to bed, but kind of relaxing. So, you know, if it's morning for you, get a nice cup of coffee, nice cup of tea. If you're here in the U.S., chill. Get a little wine, get a little beer, get a little tea, whatever your beverage is, and go from there. Me, I just do seltzer water. I'll be doing wine soon, by the way. I swear I'm going to do wine. My wife won't let me do the wine, but I'm going to do wine. Anyway, you don't want to hear me babble. You want some content. Let's talk. Let's chat. Right? All right. I want to talk. I want to start with jelly. Yeah, jelly. I'm starting out with jelly and jam right now. So how many of you have read the book by uh, uh, Dr. Robert Cialdini called Influence? Dr. Robert Cialdini wrote a book called Influence. How many of you read that book? Let me know what you, if you read, oh, give me one if you read the book, Dr. Robert Cialdini. By the way, if you haven't read it, listen to me. Listen to me. If you haven't read it, read it. Uh, it came out several years ago, but I think it is a classic. One of those books that you should just check off like, I read that book. I had to read that book. So Dr. Ch Robert Cialdini talks about um, six levers of influence, right? And maybe I should do another uh, Sales After Dark just on that one because that's an awesome book. But it is worth the investment. And, you know, go on Amazon. You probably get a used copy for a couple of bucks. But, oh, it's just gold in my opinion. Well, in there, there was a study, and I didn't find the source for the study. Uh, and the study talked about jams, right? Now tonight, what I want to do is talk about before I get into my before I start talking about jam, right? Here, let me just set this up because I I, I want to pull you in, man. I want you to get this one because what I'm about to talk to is so important. What I'm about to talk about is so important that that it just it's just I had it. This is what had to be done tonight. So I'm on this uh, live conference call, right? And this person calls in, and the person says. And they sell cars, by the way. They sell cars, right? And one of the reasons she said she wasn't able to close more deals was because the customers, when they come in, this was her thing. She says, well, the problem is that customers know a lot today. And that makes it difficult to sell. And I remember the host kind of let that comment go by. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm not letting that one slide by. Because... Are customers more aware today, have more information? The answer is yes. And my reply was, well, wait a minute. You should have, at a minimum, the same amount of information. If they're going online and they're getting 90% of the information, then you have the opportunity to go online as well and get 90% of the information. Our job is to be just a little smarter than our actual buyer. And so I'm going to explain to you why I truly believe that salespeople are the differentiators in this market. That's kind of really the, the topic, the tone of today. Why you matter right? You matter because today the world is confused on what to get. So in the book, Robert Cialdini um, uh, highlighted a study that was done by Jams. And let me give you the Jams being jelly, right? So let me give you just a thumbnail version of this uh, test. What they did is they set up a table with six flavors, right? A table with six flavors. So that was day one. They set up a table with six flavors, right? And then the second day, they set up a table with 24 flavors, right? Now, they wanted to find out, when, when people approach the table, how many people actually bought when only six options were presented. And then the next day, how many people, when they approached the table, 24 options were available, how many actually bought? Now, you probably know the answer already. What do you say? Six, the majority of people bought more when they were approached with only six options, or did they buy more when there were 24 options? Because you know, we love options. So which one do you think sold more? Which table sold more, the six Flavor one or the 24 flavor one? Come on, man, light up the board. Six, 24. Which table sold more? It's going to be interesting. Numbers are coming in. I love it. Numbers are coming in. Yeah, so you guys are awesome already. You guys are too smart for me, man. Yep, that's it. Yep, that's it. The majority, what? Six, right? Now, Carlos Portales says 24. Carlos, come on. Camlish, come on. But you tried, man. I love your guessing. What they found is very interesting. When, when people approached the table and there were 24 flavors, only 3% of the people bought. Three. Three. Let me change the color on that one. And then when people approached them when there were six flavors, what they found is that 30% actually bought. 
Now, I've used this study a lot in my presentation because I love this study because it highlights something. Because there's a, con there's a paradox here, right? A lot of us love options. We say that, we say that, we love options. Oh man, I love options, right? But when there's too many options, what happens? The brain gets confused. And that's exactly what happened here. When there's so many options, the brain simply just gets confused. And when, you, when your brain isn't sure, what does it do? It basically says, you know what? I'd rather not make a decision, right? Instead of making a decision and being wrong. Now listen to that phrase, because it's an important phrase. They rather not make a decision because they don't want to risk being wrong. That's called buyer's regret, not buyer's remorse, buyer's regret. People will, you ever buy something? To really understand what buyer's, okay, buyer's remorse, let's go through the two. There's buyer's remorse, buyer's regret. Buyer's remorse. You ever have somebody like really pressure you into buying something? Maybe put you on their time crunch or something? And then you bought, right? And then when you get home, you're like, oh, I shouldn't have bought this thing. I don't really need it, right? That's buyer's remorse. I shouldn't have bought it. I shouldn't have bought this one thing, right? That's buyer's remorse. Buyer's regret. You ever like buy something? And then there were a couple of options. There were maybe two you could choose from. And then you chose that one. And so you took that one home. But when you got home, you go, maybe I, maybe I, maybe I should have, maybe I should have chose the other one. That's buyer's regret, right? You see the difference? One, I hate the fact that I bought it. I shouldn't have bought it. This one is buyer's regret. I should have bought the other one. So people, instead of making a decision and face buyer's regret, I should have bought the other one. Say, you know what? Maybe I just won't decide right now and let me think about it. Now, this is important because our job as salespeople is to narrow down the number of options people have when they make a buying decision. Now, what does this have to do with you being the ultimate differentiator in the market? It has everything to do with it. Watch me make the tie. Watch me make the segue. Because what's happening today is that there's so much information on the internet that most people think, yeah, the consumers know what they want already. No, they don't. And by the way, you may argue with me. If they do know what they want, then I would argue right back. Yeah, they know what they want, or they think they know what they want, but you know what they really need. There's so many options out there that people are confused, which is why buying cycles are taking longer. In other words, to close deals takes longer. So let's go into, now if you don't believe me, uh, let's look at some data, but something interesting has happened in the last five years that most people aren't even talking about. Most people aren't talking about what I'm about to talk to you. In the last five years, something dramatic has happened in the sales, in the sales world. How's that for drama? Something dramatic has happened in the sales world. Something like that. Drama, right? And so let me tell you what's happening in the sales world. I'm going to start out with this study by Gartner. All right? Let me clear that. So Gartner did this study. And I remember I came across this about a couple of months ago. I was like, wow, that really validates a lot of what I was thinking. Here's what they found. Check this out. Let me go. You know me, man. I like data, man. That's just part of who I am. So because, again, if you're joining me for the first time, you, here's what I want you to take away. I can give you opinions about things, but opinions aren't facts, right? And so I like to use data to reinforce what I'm teaching. So come back. Now, what they found is that 89%, ah, let's just call that 90, it's such a cleaner number. 90% of the people, 90% of B and B, B2B buyers, let me zoom in so you can see the board, man, right there, let me zoom in. Nine, B2B buyers indicate that the information they encounter during their purchase process, meaning they're going online, was of what? What? It was of what? It was of what? Alta calidad, high quality. Now, why is this important? Because five years ago, if you're in marketing, listen to me. Marketing, listen to me, man. This is about to go down, man. Listen to me. Five years ago, marketing was in a position where they were pumping out content. You know what I mean? Writing articles, writing blogs, doing videos, generating content. And five years ago, you could position yourself in the market with your content, right? But now fast forward, everybody's producing content. But not only producing content, they're producing what? High quality content. In other words, the majority of the market is now producing high quality content, which is why it's harder for you to stand out in all this noise, right? By the way, in engineering terms, there is something called a signal to noise ratio. To understand that phrase, here, this will just be a lot small little learning moment. 
So if this is noise, right, we just say that's a signal of noise. What we're trying to do is we're trying to grab, let's just grab that little color, is that here's our signal. That's your signal right there. Let me zoom in so you can see your signal, right? That's your signal right there. That's your signal. That's you screaming to the market, trying to, hey, me. But there's so much noise going on that it's harder. Now, again, five years ago, this noise was more like this. It was just small noise. And it was easy to what? Stand out. Today, this is what we have. There's so much quality content out there that clients are simply confused in terms of what to buy. Now think about that. They're confused in terms of what to buy. I'm going somewhere with this. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. I'm going with it. So, number one, when too many options are presented, people get confused. Write that down, right? Number two, in today's market, most B2B buyers say that almost 90% of all the content they come across is high quality content. Yeah, okay, so that's a lot of options, which means a lot of content, and now it's all high quality. It's almost like having 24 flavors of high quality jelly, right? So now we got 24 flavors of high quality jelly, and now think of the number of pages online and information, call that 24 million, whatever it may be. So now, just bear with me, just hang in there with me, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up, okay? Now, here's the impact of all this. Too much good information has a what? A negative impact. This is important. Too much good information. It's kind of ironic, right? It's a paradox. It's almost like a, like a conundrum here, right? In other words, buyers are overwhelmed. Buyers, check this out, man. Like I said, man, check this out. Buyers are overwhelmed by the information, so they're what? Oh, just struggling, man, struggling to make a what? A purchase decision. That's heavy right there, man. I don't care what you say, that's heavy right there. Because you have to think about this, especially if you're in marketing, or even if you're an entrepreneur, small business owner, you're trying to pump out content, but the problem is there's so much great content out. First now, you gotta pump out, you gotta up your game, right? And then now you gotta deal with, before, you, all you had to do was up your game, get the content out, you were good. But now, you have to up your game, and then how do you stand out? How do you become different? It's becoming that much more of a challenge. That's why marketing has a key role when it comes to sales and marketing. So in other words, 55% of customers say that they're making informed trade-offs. What's an informed trade-off? It's like, uh, okay, that one. So they're kind of what? That's what a trade-off means. So there's, okay, so point number three, there's so much great content out there that customers are having a hard time making a buying decision. So they're like, uh, and by the way, is this good news or bad news? Well, it depends how you look at it. Now, this is where I believe that, I hate to use the word because people overuse it a lot, but I think the word trust is coming back into play. Yeah, the word trust. You know, I know everybody overuses the word, but I truly believe that trust is coming back into play because customers are so confused that they're looking for somebody to trust, to help them make a buying decision. And let me see, who can they trust? You, the salesperson, right? That's why building trust is gonna become very important for you. So, so now, you know that. It's harder for them to make a buying decision. Now, check this out. Check this out. This is how much time key buying activities. This is how they're buying. So let me zoom in so you can see that. This is how they're buying, right? So 25% of buyers are researching independently online. Others are meeting with groups, right? Again, researching, but look at this one. Holy buckets, that one deserves a red. This one deserves like one of those numbers. Only 17% of their time is dedicated to meeting with you, the vendor. 17%, that's it, of their time is with you, the vendor. So whatever your life cycle is or buying cycle is, you're only getting 17% of that. But wait, but wait, there's more bad news. You know how they're giving you 17% of their time? So for example, to kind of put this in numbers terms, I think of that, that the buying cycle uh, for a B2B buyer takes a month, being generous here, right? A month. So that means you got, there's 21 days in a month. Whatever 15% of 21 is, 
That's the only portion you're getting, right? They're kind of slicing it. In other words, 17% of their time is dedicated to talking to suppliers. So if we believe, let's say 20 times 17, which is about what? How many minutes is that? How many days are that? So that's 20%, let me see if I can do my head. It's about 3.4 days, three days. If, they're, if you're 21 days a whole month to make a buying decision, they're dedicating three days to actually talking to suppliers. But here's the problem, <clears throat> it does it in there. That 17% is divided. And let's say they're looking at five different suppliers. Whatever five into that, you're pretty much gonna get about three point something percent of their time, which means your num the time is going down. Do you see what's happening here? First of all, they're going online trying to figure out the information. There was one study that showed that customers actually spend about 20% of their time just trying to reconcile, listen to that word, reconcile information. By reconcile, I mean they can't tell the difference, which one's better, right? So they have to go, you know, because sometimes they'll look up information, different, two different products, they'll find two contradictory studies. So now they got to figure out, okay, who's telling the truth? It's almost like fake news, right? How do you know it's real? You know, <clears throat> you go to CNN, they tell you a story. You go to Fox News, they tell you a story, right? And then you go, who's right? You know, because they both have two different spins on it, right? Who's right? And customers are doing the same thing. They're looking at, they're talking to five different vendors. Five different vendors are saying five different things about the same thing. And they're saying, how do we figure this out? Do you see what's happening here? This, the, the customer's confused. The customer has too much information to look through, has too much quality information to look through, and at the same time, they don't wanna make a buying decision, they're scared, and even if they spend time with you, right, the customers, they're still confused trying to reconcile the information. I know what you're saying. Victor, where are you going with this, man? Where are you going with this, man? I'm going somewhere, I'm going somewhere. Just hang in there with me, just hang in there with me. Now, what they found out is that there is an ideal type of salesperson that can make the sell today. Now, in other words, in to be successful in today's market to sell in this crazy, overloaded, noisy environment, what they, they figured out is that there's three types of sellers. I wanna know which one are you. There's three types of sellers. And then I'll tell you who's the most successful and who's the least successful based on their data. And what I'm about to show you will probably change how you sell, especially if you're in the B2B market, okay? So here's what they found. Profile number one. And by the way, Gartner, an awesome company, always doing awesome studies, love them, want to make sure they get credit for this. Three sellers approaching to engaging customers with information. Three types of sellers, right? The first one is known as a giver. The giver is a giver of information. Not, not, these are people who says, you know, I can get you a lot more information. Let me give you some more information. Now, let me ask you a question. Don't fail me, my sales after dark family, my tribe, do clients want more information? Yes or no? Hit it in the chat. Do clients want more information? Do clients want more information? Uh, Herb, help me out. Herb said 3% is only 45 minutes to help to make a decision. Whatever that number is, Herb, there you go. Right? But remember, there were 21 days. So that's 15%, 17, and we'll figure out the numbers later. Do customers want more information? Yes or no? Come on, let me see some numbers. You got no, no. Tahir, no. Mia says yes. Cam Les says no. I would say no, says Carlos. Uh, clients want information that will benefit them. Oh, Erica, that was such a cop-out, Erica. Very good cop-out. Dwight Beal says no. Joe says no. Man, Arvin says yes. Alice, okay, so you got, I'm gonna go with the majority saying no. I just explained this whole thing. Customers don't want more information because they're it's just gonna confuse them even more. So what do they want? Hold on, hold on, hold on. So now, that's the first profile. And by the way, so that's the giver. Are you a giver of information? You know who you are. Let's look at the second category they came up with. I thought was interesting. The teller. The teller, let's zoom in on that baby. The teller says, let me tell you what you need to know. Let me tell you what you need to know. And they're gonna give them the information. A teller's a person who's gonna say, hey, let me just walk you through this. Here's what you need to know. 
bam, 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 bam. Good strategy, bad strategy. One for good, two, or give me a zero for not good. One good, zero no. All right, give me some numbers here. Taking my time with this one. I love your comments, by the way, all right? All right, now, it's a zero, zero, I think it's great. You guys, okay, a couple of more, zero, 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 zero. No, either either does that, okay. Yes, no, abs Mike case like, absolutely. Mike is so convinced, absolutely, Victor. You gotta tell him, Victor, you gotta tell him. That's what Mike is saying. Ramesh Power says, absolutely, Victor. Yes, that's a big one. Uh, Chad Stingley from Chicago, Illinois to Phoenix, Arizona, sales baby. Thank you, Victor, for all your teaching. Thank you, but Chad, answer my question, okay? <laughs> So keep that one in mind. So that's the second profile. Then the third profile is this one right here. And this is the new phrase I want you to record in your head. This is the phrase, man. This is the phrase I want you to lock in because this is the phrase I want you to walk away with. This is what they're looking for. Sense-making. There's a lot of information. Let me help you make sense of it yeah this is where you're gonna win the deals this is where the happy face comes in right right that's it because that's the one what they're saying is and again this is not my opinion this is the beautiful part about this you know you can argue with me all you want but it's not my opinion these this is data this is fact what they're saying in this study and by the way in the description, you should see a link for the article to this information. Okay, so I put that in the link in the description just for you. So this is important because, and that's why I set it up the way with, when I talk about setting up too much information, what the customers want today is, let me help you make sense of that information. And I think that's such a powerful phrase, right? Let me help you make sense of the information because I know you're having a hard time making it. And now, let me ask you a question. You know the obvious one. You know which one. By the way, don't forget to hit that little right there, little subscribe button right there. That little bell right there gives you an announcement when I go live. If it's your first time, I go live on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. So, by the way, do you think I should do three days, or do you think I should do two days, or do you think I should do one day? Let me know what you think, man. Just, I, I love your feedback, man. So, if we had to rank these three, if we had to rank these three, you know who's number one, because that's why we did this one, right? You know that this one is number one. Which one do you think is number two? Which one is numero dos? Which one is number two? Is it the giver or the teller? Hit me. Which one is number two? Give it to me. Put giver or teller. Giver or teller? Giver or teller? Get that voting going, man. And then I'm gonna show you what they found. Yeah, teller number two, teller number teller. Everybody's, I think that you should do the amount of days that your schedule permits. See, Erica, you're so sweet. You're such a nice lady. Teller, teller, giver. Okay, there's some givers here, there's some tellers there, some giver. Mia Knox goes with the giver to here, okay. Salim Azar goes with the teller. Inkle John goes with the teller. Uh, Shi Shen Wong says, be prescriptive. Dude, can we stick to the script? Giver or teller, man? But you're absolutely right, man. Be prescriptive. Uh, giver. So Sergio Hunango, Hunango says, giver. With the R's roll. Okay, bam. Let me just show you the data and then go wrap this whole little session up, man. All right, here's what they found. Are you ready? I, I think this one asked you like that. <laughs> Sorry, man, I had to do that, man, I had to do that. All right, here they, here's the numbers, right here. What they found is the following. That's the data. That's the data. Now, you know that this one is definitely gonna be the sense maker right there. You know that's gonna be the sense maker. So now, let's see what's gonna go down. Boom, look at that. What they found is the teller was right in the middle. Giving people more information. By the way, let me zoom in so you can see some of the data. I think it's always important to know how big the sample size was. The sample size was 
right here. Uh, almost 1,200 B2B buyers, 2019, uh, their survey. So I think that's pretty interesting, right? I think that's pretty interesting. So sense makers were actually closing more deals than actual givers of information. And I think this is important to kind of highlight is that by giving customers more information, it's just like throwing stuff at them, you know, because again, what they're trying to do is make sense of it, if I can use their phrase. So this whole thing about sense making is really important because it allows you to what? Again, help the customer. You know, you guys, somebody put in here like trusted advisor, a phrase we always use, right? And that's great, gain their trust. But really, what the trust advi trusted advisor is doing, the action, the verb here, is helping them make sense of all this information. And I think that's powerful, man. And that's, I wanted to talk to you about that tonight. Let me know what you think of tonight's topic. And again, if this is your first time, that's what we do. We do one good topic, and then I'll take some questions and answers from you guys. I think that's all I had, man. Back to sales after dark right there, man. So I'll take some questions. If you don't have any questions, we're all good. And I'm enjoying the session, man. Tell me what you think of this, um, this study. Does the sense making make sense? I'm not trying to be funny here, uh, but does that make sense? And then I'll try to grab some questions here real quick. Uh, let me just jump into some. Uh, Right here, Chad said something interesting, man. Chad said, you know, giving is too passive. It's not assertive, right? It's just like, it's too easy. I think that's why a lot of people go for it, Chad, because it's so easy to do. So I'm with you 100%. Uh, help me to help you. Help me to help. One of my favorite sayings, I once heard a favorite TV show. I think that was Jerry Maguire. Help me help you, right? With his Cuba Gooding, uh, what was that movie? Um, what was the movie, by the way? What was the movie with... Uh, Cruz and Cuba Gooding Jr. Not dang it. Great topic, great. Uh, 15 minutes and I come out feeling a smarter and better salesman. <laughs> Way to go, man. Uh, thanks. How to become, thanks, but how to become a sense maker? A sense maker is like, it's really explaining things to people. So that, that's a good question to hear. Let's kind of, let's play with that one a little bit. There's so much information that it, this is going to require you, the salesperson, uh, let me go back to the story I told at the beginning, that the lady said customers come in with a lot of information and they're much smarter, let's say 90% of the way they're in buying. Then you have to be as smart as them, but you have to be just a little smarter because you have to help them make sense of it. You know, and so it's like anything else, it's like there's so many different options out there. That's why I think it's important that you know your niche, you know your market. Because, and by the way, when I say know your niche, know your market, I'm talking about you got to know what your competitors are offering. I'm not saying all of them. Pick your top three, the ones that always come up. Know their product. So when the customer says something like, well, you know, we're looking at product over there, you'll say, that's a great product. There's some differences. Let me help you make sense of it, right? And there's nothing wrong with that to helping people make sense of the information. And it's interesting that that's what customers want from us, to sit next to them as a trusted advisor, right? We heard that phrase. But what is a trusted advisor doing? Giving them, you know, uh, consultation, and they're also helping them make sense of the information. I hate to keep using it, but it's all about helping them, clarifying what they want. If the customer said, because I can ask you to hear, what are you trying to accomplish? And then I can say, here's how my product could help. There's other products in the market, so if you're looking for that, we don't offer that, but if you're looking for this, this is what we can do and we know we can help you. So that's how I would talk about sense making. I know I missed a lot of questions here, man, so I'm gonna try to get a lot of them going here. Uh, let me see, show me the money, that, that was it, yeah, show me the money. Jerry McGuire, man, I did have, okay, cool. Thank you, man, appreciate it. I know I missed some of you. If I missed your comments, man, I'm not ignoring you, man, uh, but thank you, man. Everybody has show me the money. Everybody knows the movie, right? Two days only because I feel I missed out. I missed your session, man, thank you, man. Uh, Gigi, sense maker, ask a lot of questions, especially on the outcome part, right? Like what is it that they're trying to accomplish, right? And we ask a lot of questions with the intent of not interrogating them, but trying to figure out what are you trying to get done? What are you trying to do? Uh, you guys got the Jerry Maguire thing down, Matt. Way to go, Matt. Victor, I see that Malaysians, Asians, want more information before they decide to buy. Does culture demographic play a role in decision making? I think so, I think so. Uh, you know, why do I, but, but I also think it's personality type. And so, uh, Sai in my, uh, one of my, here, let me just take you off the board here. And I, one of my other live streams, I talk about this, I use four personality types. And that's the one that's, the person is social. And then the person is, I think it's amiable, I use, amiable, and I'll explain this a little bit. 
this one, the other A was, I forgot, the analytical person, right? Analytical. And then the other one is, you know, they like to be in control, right? We'll call them demanding and, you know, and they're dominating. That was the other word I used, dominating, right? And so a person who's social, they never really make any decisions, right? A person who's amiable, these are people who really want you to listen to them, right? When you talk to them, they want you to ask them a lot of questions. They really want you to ask questions, but also listen to what they're saying. So that person wants to connect, right? This person will never buy. They just like talking. You've met that person. This person is trying to connect with somebody who understands their pain. The analytical person, the analytical person, this is a person who wants data. Just give me the facts. Just give me the data. Just give me the facts. Let's just walk through the numbers. Let's just go through it, right? And then there's the people who are demanding or dominating. They're, they want to be right all the time. So I think this exists everywhere. I, I use this analogy. Sai, and in one of my programs is I take a piece of candy, right? That's wrapped up in a wrapper, right? And then what I do is I take the wrapper off the candy. So I have the wrapper here, the candy here, right? And I tell people this. I said, look, I said, selling is like candy. He says, the candy itself represents the human brain. The wrapping around the candy represents culture. Now, I'll never be able to understand your culture, and I throw the wrapper away, but I can understand the brain. And all of us have the same brain. The wrapping may be different, we'll call that culture, but the brain is the same. It's motivated the same way. So I answer it that way because there are some differences, but there's also, there's more similarities than difference. And there are cultural cadences that I know that some are longer, some are, you know, uh, if, you know, when I used to sell in, um, I remember going to uh, Tel Aviv, Israel years ago, right? And when, when I go to Israel, they're like this, man. They're like, they're right here. They bounce between these two, right here, right? Right? And then I go over to the Middle East, right? Uh, let's say like, you know, like Saudi Arabia, you know, or any of the Gulf states, right? Oman, Jordan, beautiful places, by the way. Then I see a lot of this, right? And if I go to Singapore, I probably see a lot of that. Do you know what I mean? So once you figure out the personality styles, I think you'll be able to do, you know, you kind of adjust your style to what they're doing. So anyway, I hope it was a long answer to your question. Sorry about that, man. So anyway, I hope I answered it though. Uh, let me see. Become a, Kevin Durkin says, become a value creator every time, Matt, every time. Sense maker for firms like Accenture, McKinsey, et, et cetera. Uh, that's what has differentiated them for all these years. Absolutely, right? Every company like that is what they're doing. They want somebody to sit next to them, but again, you gotta earn the right to sit next to them. How do you do that? By helping them make decisions. And especially if you're in B2B. Some of these solutions, Carlos, we were talking about the solutions you're looking for. They're not easy because there's so many flavors out there, so many variations, subtle variations, that you know, if you're gonna be in sales, you better know that product. So, do I got it? Uh, yeah, you guys got the old, again. The Jerry Maguire. Making sense is helping customers to gain trust in your expertise. It is what you are doing, explaining why the data you're showing is important to us or them. Right. You got it, man. It's just walking them through it. Uh, Arvin, my man. B2B, most B2B are transactional buyers and don't need relationship like advisors. Uh, does free trial supersede sense makers and tellers? Your insights. When you say most B2B are transactional buyers, I don't know if I agree with you on that one, Arvin, because uh, we got to be more specific, right? I, I'm, I'm almost sure we, we agree if we were to define what we mean by B2B. If I'm selling a, I don't know, a half a million, $1 million system that I'm going to put in, right? Or something that I'm going to put in a data center, uh, it's not transactional. Now, if it's, so when you say transactional, I don't know what your time frame is. Are you talking about like SaaS platforms, simple things? Now, if we move downstream, so to speak, where it's not well, let me just describe it this way. Would you, because we got to agree first before I answer this question. Would you agree that if the dollar value is high, if the dollar value is up here, it's not transactional. But as you move down towards the dollar value, it could still be B2B, like small business owners. Let me just take that off for you, Arvin. Then all of a sudden, then it becomes a little more transactional. But it isn't so much over-the-counter stuff. I think that's, to, if we can agree on that, then... Now let me look at your question, and let's see. So uh, you don't need a relationship uh, like advisors. Does a free trial supersede sense makers and tellers? Let's talk about don't need a relationship. I agree. In many markets now, 
B2B, low value cost. In other words, not a half a million dollars, something, let's say, I don't know, a thousand bucks. Uh, they don't want a relationship. They want a transaction. You and I are in total agreement there, right? Because there's some, as you move down, it's a, look, just give me what I want. I know what I want. Let me do what I want. I think free trials are important. I do. Because especially if there's a lot of options out there and what you want to do, when you look at, uh, there was a book that was written several years ago and I talk about it in my new book. Uh, it was called Freemium. Uh, let me know if you're familiar with that one, Arvin, Freemium, which talks about the psychology of giving stuff away for free because it ties giving stuff away for free into sunk cost. And you know what I mean by that, by sunk cost? And that is, if I let you start using a CRM, I remember Zoho years ago, Zoho used to all give you a free CRM. And you can load this thing up with data. So what you do, here's a database. You load it up with data. And then after, let's say, I don't know, 90 days, they'll try to say, hey, let me upsell you. You're not going to want to switch because you've put all your what? Content in there. You're not going to do it again. And so I like freemium. I mean, look at Facebook. Perfect example of freemium, right? They give it to you for free. And then we've loaded up all our content down there, our relationships, our pictures, our videos. We share them with everybody. And for you to switch to another platform right now, even though you don't pay anything for Facebook, really, but to switch to another platform becomes difficult because of the sunk cost. Sunk cost being the investment you've made that if you decide to go to another platform, you got to take everything and move it over. You're not going to do that. So I like I like the free uh, sample. I, I would I would do the free sample, man. Uh, then paint the picture and include the live one in your picture. Yeah, put them in the picture. You know, it's like when you go buy a car, right? They put you in the car, put them in the picture. Best way is making a way through uh, by highlighting essential and critical knowledge of value of product or service. Absolutely, Kenry. Can't argue with that. Not the Yep. Uh, guide them to the light. Sounds weird, man, but I get I get, I get what you're saying, man. Uh, be consultant. I love it, man. Uh, there was something on perfect. You got uh, JM. How do you deal with customers whose ego just get offended when faced with someone who does not who does know more than them? Well, the thing is. You know, even when I deal with the dominating people, you know, when I deal with people who are very dominating, you know, there's always a time when they just want to know everything, man. You know what I mean? They're just so, I know everything. And I just feed the ego. The question, I mean, here's the thing. Here's how I would argue with you on this or debate with you on this. If they think they know everything and they actually do, then you just ask questions to guide them because they already know the answers, right? So just asking questions to guide them. Now, if they think they know it all and they don't, the, the challenge is finding a polite way of saying, you're wrong. But when somebody, tell, when somebody demonstrates to me that they know a lot already, I respect that knowledge. I put my ego in check. So one of the things I train salespeople on is that too often we want to show too much or demonstrate that we know a lot, right? And so sometimes we need to keep our ego in check. Even when the customer says something that you know is totally wrong, you're like, there's no way that's possible. There's no way that's true. And when, I, when a customer says that to me, I always ask them questions. Remember, with questions, you can control anybody. I don't care how dominating they are. So if somebody says something that I know is totally wrong, I would say, really, I've never heard of that. I said, how does that work? Now they have to explain what statement they just made. And then I can ask, you know, and I can ask them more questions. And eventually, they're going to realize maybe they aren't right. And I've had this happen a lot of times. So I don't know if that helps, but there it is. I'm interested in Victor Antonio Sales Bootcamp. Will that be available someday? One day, Chad. I used to have this program that would do live. It was called the, um, the Sales Mastery Intensive. Uh, 12 people, 12 modules for 12 hours. Yeah. And so that was one full day, 12 hours from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. You think that's a long time? The longest we went was actually like 14 hours. Now, I have to confess that after like 7 p.m., we just went over by the, um, the lobby and ordered pitchers of beer, and then we just kind of really hashed it out. But one day, Chad, when this is all over, uh, I'm going to start doing some uh, online webinars where I get into actual details. Um, and so I might do my first webinar that I haven't done in a while at the end of August. I'll be posting that online, and then I'll go. it'll probably be a half-day webinar where I go into a topic very specifically. Uh, and it's going to be surrounding the new book. But thanks for asking, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, Kevin says the question behind the question. There it goes, man. There's always a question behind the question. Uh, you got that? Cool. Let you guys go on that. I'm in the waterproofing industry and I'm the top salesman in my company right now. Love it already. Said Hill. Uh, 
I love selling, but the admin work really kills me. How do you keep yourself sharp, fresh over long periods of time? Man, that admin part. They're doing studies right now, said here, where it's one of those things where we're spending about two thirds of our time, two thirds, like 67% of our time doing admin work and things that could be done by somebody else, right? But it's part of our job, like, you know, and on the other hand, you got managers who say, look, but I need you to fill in like, the, for example, the CRM. You're like, oh, I don't have time to fill in the CRM. And there's always that grand debate. And so if you're killing it, like I, you tell me you are, you know, have you thought of, considered, you know, hiring an assistant? Now, you're probably thinking, well, Victor, I work for a company. I can't hire my own assistant. Yes, you can, right? Because you can find any of these services that you can pay out of your own pocket. Because think about it. If you can rec recover, not maybe two thirds, maybe one more third of your time by hiring somebody for whatever fee they're charging, right? And again, you can get a virtual assistant to do all the stuff you don't want to do. Think about that. That's an option there that we have today. That's an option you have today that I didn't have back then. Uh, so we had to do it all, but I think that's an option for you. I think you should consider that, man. I think you should consider it. And how do I keep myself fresh over a long period of time? You got to give yourself a break, man or else you'll kill yourself. You'll run yourself into the ground. And so make sure that during the day, you know, find at least two periods, two periods where you can just, you know, and it only has to be like for 15 minutes. Just, I used to take a lot. I used to do early morning, right? Early morning before anything got started, I did what I had to do, whether read, catch up, do what I wanted to do. And then during lunch, I would actually, you know, leave the office, drive somewhere to a park or something, read a book, maybe sometimes take, take a nap for like 15, 20 minutes, because I, I do power naps. And that to me, man, just kept me fresh, man. So, you know, consider that, man. That might be helpful, man. Ankle John says what? Great topic, man. Can you give me one or two mind-blowing questions? Something will hit clients when selling life insurance. Uh, let me see, you're putting me on the spot. Something mind-blowing. You know, um, there's nothing mind-blowing to tell insurance people. One of the, I mean, when you're selling life insurance, one of the things we're trying to figure out is how do you create that sense of urgency? And without scaring them too much, because then you come across as a high pressure salesman. And so I think the, the biggest mind blowing question, which isn't mind blowing at all, is if something were to happen to you tomorrow, how would you pay for this? I said, walk me through that scenario. You know, again, one of my coaching clients does disability. And one of the questions I asked him to ask his clients and make sure they answer it completely if tomorrow you were disabled, right, for whatever reason, and you would lose half your salary, you would lose your benefits and any type of 401k contribution and matching, how would you make up that financial difference? How would you make up that financial difference? And then just go quiet and let the person think about it. I mean, that's a tough one, man. So, you know, so hopefully that was good enough, man. But uh, there's so many things you're going to do. Facts digging to enhance the customer experience needs. Yep. Sense making with eight Ps. I think so. I think so. Let me see what else we got here. Oh, by the way, Kevin, uh, this is for my man to sit here or use Upwork. I love Upwork, by the way. How many folks use Upwork? Upwork is a place where you can upload stuff, like for me, for graphics, editing, and things of that nature. Or if you need something designed, if you need some programming, you need some small app, you can find people to do it or virtual assistants. So I want to buy one of your custom pick jeepers. God, man, Brad, one day, you're going to wear me down eventually, man. I would suggest a review on this book. Which book is this? I would suggest a review on this book. Let me know which book is that, and then we can figure out what we're going to review. By the way, again, man, if you like the stuff, hit the like button. And the only thing I ask from you guys is to share it with one other person, man. That really helps me, and it builds the community a little bit. That's the only price I ask. Uh, let me see what else we got. Uh, I'm going to go through some of these, and I'm out of here. Uh, real quick, complexity in dollars, more B2B. A uh, high dollar value simplicity would be very transactional, like selling pencils. Absolutely. So there's that right there. And uh, Arvin was absolutely is right. Again, when the when the amount of money goes down in terms of the transaction value, it's going to be more transactional. And people don't want a relationship; they just want the best transaction they can. So Carlos, I'm with you. Arvin, I'm with you as well. Uh, let me see. Got that one already. I'll do one or two more. Then I'm out of here. Is it more challenging to uh, working on sales for a small company with no sales process or big ones with a very defined role? My personal opinion, it's easier with a big one with a defined role. That's what I would say, Elkin. I've worked with small companies 
And when you don't have a defined sales process and you don't have a support structure around you, it makes your job hard, man. It really does. Now, the opposite is, but small companies give you freedom to do a lot of things your way. That's the downside of working with a large company. They have a way, they have a methodology, they have a proven method, they want you to do it that way. Do it like this. It's almost like they choreographed the dance for you. So there's the trade-off, right? Do you want freedom or do you want consistency? Or if you can if you can marry them both, man, that would be the ideal situation. What a great question, man. What a great question. Arvin Garcia, it might be, okay, B2B, it depends on the customer purchase process, but most of the time they choose for trust, relationships, customer experience. Perfect, love it. Sight. Thank you so much, Victor. You made sense. Ha, got it. I must say that I have improved much selling after watching your videos. We'll keep the four types of human brains in my mind. Yeah, the different types of personality. And so, uh, let me see. We got Paco in the house, graduate one of those cohorts. Yep. By the way, so he was in, Paco did attend one of my uh, my uh, 12 hours, 12 modules, you know, uh, 12 people, uh, sales mastery intensive. It was intense, man. It was intense. Hey, by the way, so I want to show you something, okay? Because I got to, I'm going to tune out a bit here because we're into an hour already. So people keep asking me about my show Life for Debt. So I thought I'd pull up a clip because most of you haven't looked at it. So here's the show Life for Debt. This was a show, a TV show that I did where I was the host of the show. And let me see if I can actually get this thing going. Let me see if you guys can see it. You'll tell me if you can see it or not. And I don't think I'll be able to pull it up. Dang it, I was hoping to pull it up for you. So let me see, hold on one second. Let me see if I can pull it up. If I can't pull it up, can't do it for you. I was so excited to show you this video and I can't pull it up. Dang it, all right, it'll have to be on the next one. But if you type in life or debt, you can actually see the show. And I think it's a really cool show. Hold on one second, let me try one more thing. If this doesn't work, I give up totally. Yep, it's locked in because we're live. So check out the show, Life or Dead. It's a good show on how to manage money and all that stuff. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed uh, this session. So as always, final thoughts. The final thoughts are these. Keep in mind that there's so much information out there that everybody now has to raise their game in terms of delivering quality content. That's the big takeaway. Also, even customers acknowledge that there's so much quality content out there, A. B, is that there's so much of it they can't tell, right? They can't make sense of it. So that's where we come in. Don't give customers more information. We know that's the worst way of doing it. Don't tell them, it's not the best way. You could probably close, that's okay. But the best way is to help them make sense of it. Think of the jams or the jellies, right? There's so many options. Your job is to say, for example, if you use the 24 jelly example, and we want to do sense making, before I'd sell them any of the jams, I would say, well, tell me a little bit about your flavor. Tell me about what you're liking about different flavors. Also, what time of day are you planning to eat this? Eat this, Or what are you going to eat this with? And based on the information I gather, I can help them make sense and also I can narrow down the options and guide them towards the actual solution. That's what customers want from you today. So again, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you again for joining me on the Sales After Dark. We will see you on Sunday. Now, Sunday I'm reviewing the account business marketing. You want to be in on this one. I'm telling you, this one is, it's, it's funny how things change, but they also stay the same. I'm going to show you how account-based marketing use or account-based sales used to be done, but what's happening today? There's a shift in the market. Much like sense making, we, we're shifting into making sense for the customer. There is a shift in how marketing and sales are now working together and how your company, maybe you, can benefit by understanding how you're gonna actually bring more customers into the pipeline and be more successful. So I will see you on Sunday. You guys are awesome. Thank you for joining me. And again, don't forget, share this with at least one other person. Take